Thank you so very much for joining us for this such an important session around exponential policy. And it's my absolute uh, pleasure to pass over to Maya to lead this session. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. For that brilliant introduction, also with the very practical information, <laughs> very helpful. And welcome everybody to this session on exponential policy for, for climate system change from laggards to disruptors to drive system change across sectors, across regions of the world, in fact. So my name is Maya Groff. I'm the convener of the Climate Governance Commission, also a now partner and a co-convener of a new future economy forum, uh, which we're launching in uh, Cairo just before COP27, in case you want to come together to discuss these issues and others uh, even further, you're all very, very welcome. So we have a really brilliant uh, panel today. We have uh, Magnus Yaiborn, who's the head of research at Global Challenges Foundation, Arana Bagosh, who's the CEO on the of the Council on Energy, Environment and Water, based in New Delhi. Johan Falk, of course, founder and head of the Exponential Roadmap Initiative. We have uh, Daira Pujara, CEO and the founder of Y Center. Rebecca Shirley, director of research and data innovation at World Resource Institute Africa. And also Lars Lundström, the chief sustainability officer at H2 Green Steel. So we have a really diverse uh, panel with a broad range of expertise and uh, the work that we're going to be discussing today and workshopping further, in fact, is uh, out of a pioneering uh, innovation uh, collaboration between the Exponential Roadmap Initiative and the Climate Governance Commission last year uh, that was featured in our 2021 uh, report, Governing Our Climate Future. So based on the work of the Climate Governance uh, Commission in, in its first year uh, with expert explorations all around the world, we're trying to figure out through a governance lens, how can we accelerate the energy transition, get all the policies in place uh, that we need at scale in time. And uh, in the commission's interim report, we really uh, honed in on, on what we saw as three key uh, action gaps to meet the climate challenge. First, a solution action gap. We know that the solutions exist, such as Johan has mapped out in an exponential roadmap initiative, yet the action is not yet uh, sufficient and at scale. Also, there's a policy gap. We don't have uh, sufficient uh, sharp enough policies to drive these solutions, to support these solutions, and we don't have the policies diffused properly internationally at scale. And finally, there is a governance and a global governance gap. So we're going to be talking about these uh, gaps today in, in our discussion. And in particular, we're going to be talking about this, this uh, notion, this concept of exponential policy uh, that, that Johan and Magnus started to think about and, and, and to really um, uh, have, have, have a basis for a new type of thinking about policy that really drives system change. So to kick us off, uh, let's turn to Magnus and, and Johan to, to explain uh, what they mean by exponential policy and why they think it's so vital. Thank you, Maya. It's great to be here, and thanks for the introduction. I'll start with the, the science, basically. The science is very clear, just to recap that we need to halve emissions every decade, uh, and which means basically 50% by 2030 and so on in order to avoid dangerous climate change. At the same time, we need to scale the carbon sinks and protect nature. So we also released a new report on natural climate solutions, which basically shows that it's not sufficient just to cut emissions from the fossil economy. We also need to protect nature and build the carbon sinks in parallel. In the exponential roadmap, which we published like two years ago, we showed that the solutions do exist to halve emissions by 2030. And it, it won't be precisely the solutions, but I would say solutions are available in all areas. They need to scale in parallel, not sequentially. That's extremely important. 
The challenge, however, <coughs> is not how to cut emissions. We know we can do that immediately. Uh, the big challenge is that we need to shift out the fossil-based economy to, uh, to the climate solution sufficiently fast. Because otherwise we risk an economic collapse, crisis, and big sufferings, as we see now, because we basically don't have a substitute. So we need that laser focus on scaling the solutions. And we are not scaling them sufficiently fast. So that is incredibly important. And <clears throat> we, as humans, we normally think in a linear fashion, but most innovations and solutions follow this uh, exponential S-curve, which means that they go really slow in the beginning until they reach a particular point, and then start to accelerate in, in, in a quick phase. And uh, so what can we do, basically, if we assume that these are the climate solutions they are following such a pathway? There are basically two ways to accelerate. We can either push the curve to the left. That could mean, for example, for fossil-free steel, instead of having 10 years to market, we can actually take it to market in five years, which I think is happening in Sweden, for example. Pull the curve to the left, it's the first strategy. The second strategy is make the curve steeper. The pace of doubling, basically, make it steeper. One example could be uh, the shift to electrical vehicles in Sweden, where we applied policies, uh, economical policies, to actually accelerate adoption. So we quickly moved from 25% of new sales to 55, 60% of new sales. We will, I think, hit in two years. My guess is 90% of new sales. Policy incredibly important to actually influence these diffusion curves because a natural diffusion curve is too slow as far as we see it. So it needs to be accelerated and policy will be incredibly important. So Magnus, please uh, elaborate a bit on the importance of policies. Yes, thank you very much. So it has been a very uh, productive and good collaboration with Exponential Growth Month. Um, so one of the key messages of the, or key insights from the Exponential Growth Month is that the transformation processes and the fusion of new technologies um, and new behavior of patterns among us, they do not typically follow a linear pattern where like, it grows, but it, it follows a non-linear pattern where, where there are positive and negative feedback mechanisms that can either, um, either prevent um, development or accelerate development. And when there are often tipping points that once you pass them, you set in motion uh, self-sustaining processes and accelerating processes. And that has important implications for the kind of policies that, that can be effective to uh, support change. But actually, the same is true for the problem itself. It has been more and more uh, observed by scientists that climate change and the effects of climate change is not are not linear processes either, but that there are also these kind of feedback mechanisms that can accelerate um, the negative, like the destruction of, of life-supporting systems. And that there are tipping points that once we cross them can lead to like this kind of accelerating and self-sustaining processes. So some of these, um, with regard to solutions, one key uh, policy implication is that um, no, you dropped it. Uh, yes, you need to, in order to design effective policies, we need to understand the feedback mechanisms, both the feedback mechanisms that prevent solutions to take, take to take off and become um, become realized, but 
because of the feedback mechanisms can, that can speed up them. So one such feedback mechanism is, for example, um, the scale of econ economies of scale that large production volumes lead to lower prices per unit normally. And since new solutions, well, they are smaller to begin with than the incumbent solutions. So electric cars were few in the beginning and they're competing with like a, a huge fossil-based vehicle fleet. And that means that the, the production cost of each electric vehicle is very much larger than, than um, a petrol-based vehicle, for example. So you can compare this while with pushing a, a carriage over a hill top. So at first you have gravity as your enemy, that you have to push against gravity. But once you pass the hill top, then gravity will be your friend and will do the job for you. So then the carriage will take take speed and, and, and accelerate by itself. So cost here is like gravity. To begin with, you need to push the new solution and grab the cost gravity prevents development. But once you reach the hilltop, then cost gravity will be doing the job for you. And when you, when you look at renewable energy, for example, it was much more expensive with wind power and solar power a decade ago than coal power or, or fossil power. But that has changed. In many markets, it is now more, uh, like less expensive than wind power or solar power. So now gravity is working in the opposite direction. So that means that policies could be designed to do this first push. It's not, you, you, you might need to have some kind of policy design to reduce the, the price difference or the cost difference to begin with. But that doesn't mean that the new solution is more expensive per se. It means that you push it over the hilltop, then it takes off by itself. So very, it means that small policy interventions at the right time, and well, well designed small policy can have disproportionate, can have very large and disproportionate uh, impact. Uh, and that is often neglected. Like you think about the new technology, like in the discussion about wind power or renewable energy in Sweden at least, but I think it is still described as it is more expensive, that it is a cost to invest in these new joints. And that was true 10 years ago, but it's no longer true. Another important lesson is that timing is important. It matters when you do policy interventions. And very often it's more important or it's more effective in the beginning. Because that's, if you look at the, the curves here, a small intervention at this point will move the curve very much to the left. But a much larger intervention at this point will have much less effect. And we often, I think, underestimate the importance of policy to begin with. Because the third lesson is that, that uh, since exponential development is often very slow to begin with. We underestimate the power of, of transformation, the, the, the potential for transformation. Many people discard renewable energy or electric cars just like a couple of decades ago because it was so small that it couldn't have any substantial impact. But that's when you can do something about it. That's when policy really has potential for for impact. We do the same mistake with, with the bad exponential developments like pandemics. We underestimated the potential damage of the COVID pandemic to begin with. We thought that this is just like an ordinary flu or something. But that's when you can do something about it. Once it takes off, policy has less impact. So it's really necessary to be have well designed and, and timely. Interventions and like the fourth thing I would like to say is that um, so exponential. This goes also for climate change. Like if you have 
this kind of non-linear developments of the impact of climate change, like the melting of glaciers, or we don't notice it right now. But once it takes off and we start to see the effects, then we may not have the, the ability to do something about it. So one very important lesson from this is that we are much worse off than we think, but we also have much more power to do something about it than we think. Great. So, <laughs> Thank you. No, very helpful overview of your thinking about this, this uh, concept of ex exponential policy uh, to date. So now we're going to move into a bit more of the practice of, of this concept and experiences. So I'd like to first call on Lars to please uh, come, come up and uh, there's the remote for your slides. And it would be great if you could tell us, uh, you know, hi highlight how H2 Green Steel is an example of a disruptive uh, company really leading the transformation in the steel sector and any uh, thoughts you have uh, at this point on, on the policy environment that you've been working in and if it fits this model or not. But we can come back to that later, hopefully also if we have time. So over yeah, to you. Excellent. Uh, first, thanks for having me. Uh, and as much as I love disruptors, we want to see ourselves as neighbors because we, will, we think collaboration is going to be key mm. uh, to the transition. And uh, so we will happily work together with our peers and every mm. other parts of the society, which I think is needed. So that's just on the disruptor note, uh, challenging that tiny bit. Uh, but let's get into steel and, and the short background. Uh, H2 Green Steel was launched last year in February. Uh, with the ambition to build a new greenfield plant uh, to produce uh, low fossil or green steel, as we call it. Um, and it will be based in uh, the northern parts of Sweden. And why would we end up here? In brief, uh, there is a good, uh, good availability of renewable energy. Um, there is a good availability of talent and infrastructure. And... Uh, those are kind of the basics. Mm. And steel is actually one of the pieces of the problem. Uh, and uh, it's also a fundamental part of our way of living because you find steel in anything, right? Uh, or you find it in the production methodology in products you use or services. So steel is everything, it's everywhere, but unfortunately it also comes with a cost. And the cost in CO2 terms of the steel industry is 3.5 billion tons of CO2 annually. And, and this is actually uh, one of the ideas behind uh, H2 Green Steel, um, to meet or to be part of ch changing this challenge. And we have set ourselves on a mission uh, with a purpose that, and I'm actually gonna talk about a little about purpose. Everyone is talking about technology and finance. I will talk about that a tiny bit, but also about people because people is super important for trans transition. Uh, we have set ourselves on a purpose to decarbonize hard to bait industries. And we start with steel because steel has both the technological and uh, commercial actually maturity to work with for us. And um, as a startup, um, we can do, try to do, I should be humble. I should, we can try to do things right from the start. So first thing we do is try to build sustainability in the broader sense into our co corporate DNA. And we have kind of uh, translated the SDGs into our four pillars for sustainability, which is planet, people, prosperity, and governance. And we try to work with all these, even if mm -hmm. the CO2 case is central to our case. And why do we do this? Um, we believe that we do it because we have to and because we can, actually. But also, uh, it's the foundation of our business case. So um, one piece of the solution is actually what we are trying to do here is raise a lot of money. This, is, this plant that you see in the picture will uh, cost us uh, about 4 billion euros or dollars, which is approximately the same now, uh, to build. And how we do this is actually we have pre-sold the steel to mainly European off takers. So we already pre-sold uh, 1.5 million tons out of the first phase, 2.5 million tons. And we have sold it with a premium. 
and that is actually helping us to get money in from investors naturally and also banks. Uh, but what about the purpose in, uh, for the rest? It's, it's, uh, it's also a story about chemistry, engineering, uh, digitization, collaboration, and people. So first, chemistry. The trick about green steel in our world is to uh, replace coke with H2, hydrogen. So when we uh, react the iron ore, this is tiny bit technical, but when we react the, uh, the iron ore with hydrogen instead of coke, our plant will emit water instead of CO2. Um, and this is based on huge scale hydrogen production and this direct reduction of iron and also integrated steel making. So in that way, we make an integrated process and we can also be resource and energy efficient. Uh, but, and also another perspective that was super hot a couple of years ago, but less people talk about it now, but digitization. As a new starter, we can also uh, leverage the opportunity of digital native. So we're actually building a digital twin of the factory already now. The factory is just a model right now, right? So we're making this digital twin, and by that we can also work with optimizing the entire process. And we are committed to also use CO2 as our second currency. Mm -hmm. So in our business transactions, we will measure money, euros mm -hmm. and dollars and kronas that we have in Sweden, but we'll also measure it in, in CO2. So we're right now building up how can, how can we work with the counting principles and the model of a balance sheet, the P&L, uh, to work with CO2 as a second currency. And this actually is a remote place of the world. Northern Sweden is a sparsely populated place in the world. Uh, so to make this happen, collaboration is key. Also with the local community, with all the authorities, and also, of course, natural and European and uh, global authorities, mm. because that, that is needed. And finally, at the core of a strong purpose that I think may be a little bit technocratic, but strong, to me it's strong, is people. And we actually have the advantage to be able to recruit uh, a set of talents from all over the world to this remote place in northern Sweden. There are no polar bears on the streets, but it's remote and it's uh, bright summers and, and dark winters. But what we actually do is we can attract the talent, the best in their trade. I think there are exceptions. <laughs> Myself is probably not the best in the trade, but uh, we get the best in the trade to work with this with mixed background, um, mixed experiences, and mixed origin. And uh, we are actually building a true diverse team with the ambition to make a steel company with uh, gender equality also, 50-50, women and men. And we believe that's a good recipe to success. And actually, coming back to fast, we are trying to be on a fast mission because speed is key for us to help on this tiny bit to save the world, kind of, uh, because our customers expect this and also because speed is actually a great way of problem solving. Because if you're in a hurry, you need to solve problems quickly. And that's what we try to do. So, as a first step, uh, from 2025, uh, we will be able to uh, deliver steel, as we call green steel. And the first step is with 90% abatement compared to traditional blast furnace steel. So that's, uh, that's actually stressing me a lot uh, because it's only three years out and we're building this entire plant. But this is a background, not short, but it's a background and I could speak about this for hours, of course, and I won't. That's perfect. That's a wonderful introduction and, and really inspiring uh, what, what you're up to. So let's try to come back to uh, uh, other experiences yeah. yep. uh, later in the session if we have time. So let's uh, next move to Daira. And we would really love to hear now, moving to another region of the world, uh, about the work that you've been doing with the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, or AGRA. Mm -hmm. And you've been building with 12 nations a policy hub in the agricultural sector. So this uh, caught my eye because in, in our, our Climate Governance Commission, we commissioned a report on the potential and possibility for a global climate policy clearinghouse 
which could be a, a space of innovation, sharing, learning among uh, nations, among other jurisdictions, policy actors, subnational, to really accelerate uh, the policy thinking to drive the necessary changes. So when I heard about what you were doing with, with AGRA, it, it really uh, uh, <laughs> mirrored you know, what we're thinking at the global level. So we'd love to hear about this, this, this policy work uh, that you're up to. Sure, thanks, Maya. So yeah, actually, Maya and I connected earlier in May, and she sent me this white paper report on the climate governance work she was doing. And I read this term called global clearinghouse in that report. That's the right term, right? Clearinghouse. Yeah, climate policy clearinghouse. clearinghouse. It's working title. I read the description of that. I'm like, we are doing this already, but in agriculture, and a sub part of it is climate in Africa. So what are we doing? Six years ago, I started working in Kenya with a bunch of farmers in a small county called Kangema. It may not be easily showing up on the map if you look it up. We started working there and we saw that a lot of these farmers and actually a lot of NGOs and uh, from all around the world were already there. And they were talking about, let's use data to change how you do farming. Uh, let's improve access to markets. Let's make more nutrition food, but use data to do all of this. And the farmers are like, what? It started from there. And I'm like, okay, that's interesting. I'm an engineer. And uh, I'm like, okay, let's use my engineering. By the way, I'm not very proud about it. You know, because I was taught to think very linearly. So if engineers in the room, I'm sorry for you guys. I'm sorry for myself, but I recovered from that very quickly. Uh, so yeah, as an engineer, I was taught to think very linearly. You know, you have a problem, data looks like a solution that's proposed. Let's, you know, create some database solutions. But then we realized the farmers don't care. They've been doing things for a while. And also the data sets I'm talking about are at a macro, are at a macro level. You know, I'm talking about data sets coming from European Space Agency, uh, NASA. There was an agency in Kenya called Roo Forum. They were doing all this mapping, amazing stuff, you know. Boeing was using this to do precision agriculture, all of this good stuff for private sector companies. But what about these farmers at a ground level who've been farming, small, medium holding farmers who can't afford really these big solutions? So we started creating something called as a farm hub for agriculture, a very small solution to allow farmers to collect their own data using very cheap sensors and now pushing this data in a local hub, sitting in that county itself. And who actually takes care of this data processing and who does all of that? The young people. So the young people in this county, if you go and ask them, do you want to work in agriculture? And they're like, hell no, I don't want to be wearing gum boots and I'm not 50 year old. That's the average age of a farmer in Kenya and around Africa. I don't want to do anything with agriculture. I'm going to get my degree in some kind of tech and just go to US or Europe for better job opportunities. Nobody wants to work in agriculture if you're 20 especially. And then we tell them, what about working on open data sets provided by European Space Agency, hacking those data sets to create some solutions for farmers in your county? Now they're interested because now we are talking tech. And they thought agriculture was about wearing those boots and getting into the farm. These people have never set foot on the farm. That was my first foray into using some kind of technology to actually work with the farmers. That was six years ago. I had to give you that story because that set up the whole tone for what we are doing now in 12 African countries. We scale that model from a small county to around 12 countries for now. After we started getting this data over six years, we started creating the solutions and it's, it's at a very small level so far. And then we suddenly meet this organization through some series of really fortunate events and they tell us that we want to do this kind of work at a policy level. We want, we have a lot of data by the way, from the governments, from even now farm level, we want to take all of the data, create some machine learning models. They don't know what they're talking, by the way, but they come to us. You know, it's so popular to just come and say, I want something on machine learning that uses blockchain to give me optimized output. I'm like, wait, you know, you clearly are reading a lot of blogs. Good for you. And let's just let's take a step back and let's figure out what is the goal? What's the purpose? Somebody talked about purpose here. We have people, right? Let's talk about people. Who do you want to affect? And they said, we want 30 million farmers in these 12 countries to be positively impacted by the policies the governments are making. Can you build a tool to do that? I'm like, now you're talking, okay? Now first, let's trash all the tech from here. I'm sorry, you brought me to speak about tech, but I'm going to just put the tech on the side. Let's focus on people. So we started focusing at a micro level. How much data do we have at a micro level? What do we know about avocado farmers, coffee farmers, tea farmers? We started getting this data from local county level. Now we have all the policies, by the way, the, the partner we are working with, they gave us full access to last 10 years worth of policies from these countries. 
all these policies, some of them in paper format, were digitized using a tool that we had, you know, translated in real time, put it into a document. This is an ongoing project right now. And now we are creating an algorithm to start looking for key buzzwords and actually seeing the impact, historical impact of these policies that were put in the place five years ago and what was the impact of that policy on a coffee farmer in a county in Kenya or in Tanzania. And we have now results. We actually know what worked and what didn't. And now we are using to train a model to start making predictions to help people make better policies. People, government, you know, so interchangeably used. So that is a very simple project that we started, kick, uh, we kick-started a couple of uh, months ago, actually, the, the 12 country model. And we are now realizing that we have the micro data from the farmers, we have the macro level data from government level. What we were now starting to miss was meso. So what we started doing is we started categorizing the policies into three different categories, micro, meso, and ma uh, micro, meso, and macro. And we started creating data sets at all three different levels. We started pushing them into really small buckets because otherwise, anyone here who works in data, you may know, you know, we are, list we are in the world of open data and there's so much happening. You look at them and it will make no sense to you. Oh yeah, the data is open. We have 10 years worth of climate data. What do I do with it? You know, you tell someone there's gonna be 1.5 degree increase in uh, climate in your region that's going to be really impacting your harvest and they're like no it's fine you know yesterday it was so cold and nothing happened to my crop so 1.5 doesn't seem too much but this is not how you know humans think in general but the models that we are building right now are not thought by humans the, the basis of it is human intelligence and that's where the AI comes into picture because it can take so many factors that's beyond typical human comprehension and starting to make these predictions eventually with a very simple goal to make better human focused policies, which you spoke about again. And again, I, you know, as an engineer in the room, uh, I was listening to gravity and I really like, you know, those words, it just kicks me. And then uh, you talked about um, uh, speed. Now, the physics in me really would take it to the next level. Not just the speed, but the velocity is important. So speed is of course there, but the direction in which we are moving. You can be moving very fast in the wrong direction, which we have, by the way, you know? So let's face that. So we have the speed. And I think uh, you had a wonderful line, Lars, you know, when we have very little time, we have to come up with solutions quickly. Mm -hmm. AI can allow us to do that right now, which is why we are building this platform to take in all of these policies because we do not have time to hire 10,000 interns who can you know, work on coffee and pizza and go through these documents and tell us, oh, stop doing this. This is what's gonna work for the world. We need machines to do that. And AI is allowing us to have this complex data being processed at a speed that's unimaginable and allow these governments who otherwise cannot make these decisions, which may be you know, affected by political changing landscape. By the way, this AI policy also takes care of all this catastrophic disasters that happen around the world. It accounts for all of that and starts giving you the small outputs. So that's a very small project that we are developing for agriculture. It has tones of climate, it has tones of youth employment, all of it. And when I you know, just heard about climate governance project around global clearing house, it was very clear that we need some similar solutions for climate policies to help us make better policies. I mean, I was listening about you know, the policies that going to allow Swedish to have adoption of like 50% EV or maybe 90% EV in the next three years. What is that policy? How did that happen? We want to know about it. Why is it working? And if it's working, why are other countries not doing it? Who is going to share that? You know, this system is actually meant to share the successes and most importantly, what's not working. Some of the countries are straight up repeating exactly the same mistakes that have been done by other countries. Let's avoid them. Let's make new mistakes. We're still going to make them not the same ones. And that's why these models are important. And before I end this and you know, open up the floor later on for other questions, I do want to say, by the way, I'm not propagating that AI is going to solve all of this. In fact, I want to end up with the, with, with the fact which some of you may not know, but if you really want to use AI, there's a re recent, I don't know, I think 2019 there was a paper, uh, and I can find the exact name of the author for you if you come and see me later on. 2019 there was a paper that said AI typically consumes 280,000 uh, kgs, I use kgs, of CO2e, not CO2, CO2e, which means CO2 plus all this other nitrogen and methane and all the other gases. That's how much it emits to train one natural processing algorithm using machine learning, just one algorithm. That's five times more than the lifetime of a car. So 
we are using AI, I mean, there's a whole irony here. We are using AI to you know, help climate impact, but AI itself consumes insane amount of energy. So we still need to think it in terms of a larger system, the impact of using AI and tech to fight climate change while creating more problems. So, you know, I want to open up with that thought for all of us to think. And uh, thank you again. Thank for you. Yeah. yeah. Fascinating. <laughs> Wonderful. Rebecca, can I uh, welcome you up? We're sure. staying on the African continent, and uh, Rebecca's going to uh, give us some very specific context from her work at the World Resource Institute and what she sees as the interesting points and uh, how we get to an exponential policy reality in uh, the African context. Absolutely, can you hear me? Can you hear me all right? Great, fantastic. Thank you so much for having me here. It's really wonderful to be part of these discussions. This is one of the highlights for me for this week. I was looking forward to this so much. And when Maja told me about this session, I said, this is when I really have to join because the idea of exponential policies, the idea of policies that capture the full breadth of the climate change uh, value slash supply chain slash impact chain um, is, is so profound and so necessary, especially now. And some of the, the earlier speakers were explaining why. Um, and I think it's important to make sure that this level of critical thinking is seeding into all of our conversations about solutions such that the solutions to our climate crisis and, and in fact our very conceptualization of the climate crisis does not continue to sit in the space of carbon and technology. Um, so let me try and paint a picture of why I say that, using Africa uh, as, as an example. Um, so of course, as we all know, the most updated climate models uh, show that we have a shrinking carbon budget that requires deep and immediate decarbonization in industrialized economies, of course, and swift action to ensure sustainable low carbon development pathways in emerging economies. However, at the same time that that is true, the climate crisis itself is embedded within a global context of historic, systemic, and growing inequality that perpetuates deep poverty, that perpetuates uh, resource and labor exploitation, that perpetuates unemployment, unfair distribution of the burden of pollution and emissions, and ultimately that heightens social and economic vulnerability to the very climate impacts that this global system is trying to solve for and that it created. So something's got to give there, right? Um, uh, as a case in point, um, Sub-Saharan Africa, of course, is consistently identified by the IPCC as one of the most vulnerable regions in the world to climate change. We all know this. And so now there's a lot of attention on the continent to physical adaptation strategies. But our eco-physical vulnerability to climate impacts is compounded by our economic vulnerabilities. And in particular, the fact that African economies are largely undiversified, depending predominantly on either agriculture a climate-dependent, primary commodity, export-oriented industry with very, very limited local addition or local value addition, or natural resources such as minerals and extractives, which are again exported with virtually no value addition on the continent. So then out of the jobs that can be created from these types of industries, agriculture and the extractives, which together comprise the bulk of Africa's GDP, very few of those are formal wage-paying jobs. Um, and in fact, today, the informal sector accounts for some 70% of employment across the continent and 55% of GDP across the continent. So nine, in, nine out of 10 informal workers also being women and youth. And I say that because the lack of social protection and wage exploitation often traps these groups into poverty and exclusion and in a sort of a, a cycle that you can start to imagine in your minds, such a fragile employment situation stifles local spending, which then leaves economies more highly susceptible to external stock shocks, which further exacerbates the continent's economic and social vulnerability to climate change, and so on and so forth. So there are these feedback loops that we have to be very, very conscious of, even as we're developing our, our solutions to climate. Now, how do we get to that situation with that, um, with, with that very vulnerable um, uh, uh, in, informal community of workers? Well, part of what contributes to that is the very same donor countries that are supporting just transitions policies and that are funding transition initiatives in African countries, on the one hand, penalize labor protections with the other hand. Um, so you can have la strong labor protection laws can cause a country to score more poorly on the ease of doing business metrics because, of course, this impinges on international private sector profits. 
And coincidentally, the World Bank last year announced that it was discontinuing the ease of doing business report. And so there is this perverse incentive to keep Global South workers in a perpetual state of non-protection for the sake of profits, that if we're not addressing, uh, we're waving a just transition flag in a sort of um, non-virtuous way. Another example that we could take a look at is the low input, low output nature of agriculture in Africa. Um, that it st itself stems from compounding external forces of geopolitics, global, global economics, and inequitable policies that, again, perpetuate a severe lack of investment at the level of the smallholder farmer. So for instance, we can take chocolate, something that we all love to eat, and the chocolate industry is worth more than 80 billion US dollars a year, of course, benefiting many European countries. But the many cocoa farmers in parts of West Africa that are producing all of the cocoa that goes into coffee are poorer now than they were in the 1970s and the 1980s. And so why is that? Well, the cost of farming cocoa on exhausted lands continues to increase. Yet, because countries like Ghana and Ivory Coast remain global price takers of their own commodity that they're growing on their own soil, um, they continue to be at the, 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 the wisp of um, the global price setters who are their buyers um, and who transmit along global commodity chains um, the, the prices. And uh, this leaves a major burden on the smallholder producers themselves that again have the least possibilities, the least um, opportunities to deal with risks. And it's a similar story if we look at coffee and any other major cash crops that are coming out of the continent. One other example I'll give before I close is, um, it was Fashion Week last week, New York, mm -hmm. New York Fashion Week. Uh, and now we're at New York Climate Week, right? And so these two things are back to back. And it's great to see the fashion sector leaning into sustainability. But as we know, a lot of the Western fashion market thrives on low wage labor in Bangladesh and thrives on local secondhand markets for goods in Africa. That's how it can be so cheap to buy clothes here in New York City. Um, and so what that means is that as even the fast fashion sector, which is responsible for 10% of global emissions, is rebranding and thinking about reducing emissions, if we're reducing emissions while still relying on prison labor and exploitation in the global south, leaving these economies vulnerable to the market volatilities that climate exacerbates, are we really sustainabilizing the fashion world? Um, and so these are some of the questions we need to be asking, right? And I think um, I just give these, I give these examples because um, this is why I think that the, the idea of exponential policy was so compelling to me is because if we're thinking about solutions only from one side of the equation, mm. then we're, we're, missing, we're missing something so important. And carbon free doesn't always mean catastrophe free, right? And the, the, the transition to, to low carbon economies may be inevitable, but a just future is not necessarily inevitable. So I think I just wanted to sort of set that context um, so that even as we're thinking of solutions, answers only, of course, um, we have a full, a full, the feedbacks in mind of what leads to what leads to what, especially in the global south. Thank, Thank you. you. Absolutely highlighting key social protections, labor protections, human well-being, as, as has already been talked about, that these are key part of the policy package, which have to be integrated and then also reflected at the international governance level yes. with international organizations, in trade policy, et cetera, it has to be Absolutely. fully coherent. Excellent. Okay, we're moving next to round us out to Arunaba. And we're just really looking forward to hearing your thoughts on whatever you've, you, you've heard today that, that has uh, piqued your interest and uh, ideas of exponential policy and transitions in different sectors, maybe the energy sector, as, as you wish. And also, it would be fantastic if you could share a little bit about the work that you did uh, for the Climate Governance Commission on the international platforms, collaborative platforms for uh, distributed rural uh, renewable energy uh, acceleration and also the, the Green Hydrogen International Collaboration Platform which would in themselves be an international policy intervention at the, the, the early sort of uh, initial stage of deployment of, of these solutions. Uh, so love to hear your thoughts. Please come on up. Thank you, Maya, and good afternoon. Is that all right? That's stood. Um, firstly, many thanks for having me here. Uh, I'm Arunabha. I run a, a, an independent think tank called the Council on Energy, Environment, and Water. 
and I also serve on the UN Secretary General's high-level expert group on the net zero commitments of non-state actors. Um, from everything I've been hearing, so much inspiration uh, you can derive. I uh, try to summarize it in the mantra that we use at CEW, that everything we do should deliver on a trifecta of jobs, growth, and sustainability. Um, now, when you think about that as a policymaker or as a political leader, it's not enough to deliver just a technology solution or just a job solution or just a climate solution. We are talking, having this conversation in 2022 when guess what, you know, if we, on 1st of January, if we didn't realize by 21st of September, we certainly know that climate action, energy security, geopolitics, uh, economic growth are all converged. And a policymaker or a political leader has to deliver almost every day on all those counts. So I'm going to give you uh, three quick examples from the solutions only perspective from at least three types of problems that I, 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 my colleagues and I are trying to solve. The first is to try and get the energy transition closer to people. And I'm just going to pick up from the great examples we heard from Rebecca and from Harriet. Uh, what do we mean by getting the energy transition closer to people? We cannot get the political sustainability for sustainability if you don't leverage the agency of people rather than think of them as the objects of our intervention. Mm. So how do you turn around that whole logic? Now, we hear about distributed renewables a lot, but we used to, in a sort of first-generation format, it used to be, well, the grid is not providing electricity, so we'll come in with some charity and put a solar home system on your, in your house, and you should be thankful to us. Uh, turn it around. How does distributed renewables become uh, a livelihood generating intervention uh, that, the, that the households um, sort of deploy and co-own and develop? Now at CW we started looking at this very carefully and we discovered that in India alone, using distributed renewables for livelihood generating activities, whether it's on the farm or off the farm, whether it's a milk chilling unit, a textile unit, a food processing unit, is a $53 billion investment opportunity. In sub-Saharan Africa, the solar irrigation pumps is a $12 billion opportunity. In Southeast Asia, similarly, you have tens of billions of dollars of opportunity. Now, here's the problem. When we actually, when we come to policy, when we actually look at international policies or initiatives that are focused on distributed renewables, we found about three dozen of them. Only three of them have so far actually focused on the productive use of these technologies. So what you're doing is, okay, we'll give you an intervention that will light up your home, but you're not actually going to help empower you to you know, uh, run, a, run a commercial unit, make income, employ local entrepreneurs, micro-entrepreneurs, and create a whole ecosystem. So at an international policy level, therefore, one of the things I did for the, global, uh, for the Climate Governance Commission was how do we create a platform where we focus specifically on the productive use opportunities and focus on value, not on volume, focus on co commercialized scale rather than just small pilots, and de-risk those investments in a way that's only possible if you're doing it at a global level rather than in individual districts, et cetera. Very quickly, second problem I'm trying to solve for is the growth story. How do we get more investment going in the very sectors where the technologies are proven, but they're not being deployed at scale? Money is not flowing where the sun shines the most. I, I mean, Darius studied as an engineer and he's trying to reform himself. I studied as an <laughs> economist, and I'm trying to reform it. Oh, boy. <laughs> uh, economics tells you capital flows from capital-rich regions to capital-poor regions. Reality tells you capital is circulating in capital-rich regions. Uh, now, how do we actually get exponential deployment of solar PV panels or wind turbines or other renewables technologies that are actually lowest-cost options today? We need to de-risk these investments by hedging across risks 
across projects across countries. It is not the fault of a Bangladeshi solar panel developer, solar plant developer, that the US Federal Reserve decides to raise interest rates and the Bangladeshi currency tanks, and their cost of capital goes up. It has nothing to do with solar. It has nothing to do with their business acumen. It has nothing to do with the country. It's a global problem that we've not solved for, which is why cost of finance is 60, 70, 80% of the cost of renewable energy tariffs in emerging markets. So a global de-risking facility will be that, that, that catalyst for an exponential deployment of capital for these technologies. Last problem that I'm trying to solve is that hard to abate sectors, the, the, the excellent example that um, H2 Green Steel is trying to deploy in, in Sweden. Now, here's the challenge, though. Largest steel producer in the world, China. Second largest steel producer in the world, India. How do we get the, where's the maximum demand for steel going to come from? Asia. So how do we actually take these, these technologies that are being developed and actually create a bridge of technology and rules and finance across the key economic regions of the world. If we don't do that, I've counted there are about 39 countries plus the EU with programs on hydrogen, on green hydrogen. There are bilateral deals happening, but these are all suboptimal. It's suboptimal because we are trying to develop and deploy this breakthrough technology within our geographical jurisdictions rather than creating collaborative platforms. So how do we create a global hydrogen, green hydrogen-based partnership, alliance, initiative, whatever you call, where the technology, the resources are pooled, the technology is developed, the off-takers come in on the steel side, on the automobile industry side. Uh, where do you get the membranes? Where do you get the critical minerals for the membranes? We need an energy secure, resilient, interdependent supply chain to really accelerate the outstanding kind of work that H2 Green Steel and other such companies are trying to do. So jobs, growth, and sustainability has to be the mantra that we filter every single policy intervention we think about uh, through. And in order to get that, get the energy transition closer to people. Get money flowing where the sun shines the most. And create genuine, resilient, and interdependent relationships for the breakthrough technologies of the future. All of these require policy interventions at a global scale, but they can trigger catalytic and exponential action. Uh, the kind that is needed um, in a solutions house like this. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. I think we only have about five minutes left in our session. Um, so perhaps we can open up to a few questions or comments if, if anyone here has a, a question for the panelists or a comment. Yes, go ahead. Travis. Thanks a lot to the speakers. I'm Georgios Kostakos from Focus, the Foundation for Global Governance and Sustainability. But I hear, uh, will speak not as an engineer that I am, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, not necessarily linear, because we did also uh, quantum physics and nuclear engineering. Uh, but also more like a farmer's boy when I grew up in Greece. So what exactly is the artificial intelligence will produce as outcome of these processes and data because my mother, who's still a farmer there, wants very practical advice on what fertilizers to use and uh, you know, the quantities and the kinds, and uh, what to cultivate now that she has oranges and olives, but if something changes, yeah. she may put mangoes, I don't know, and yeah. compete with India. So uh, I don't know if that, uh, how you combine the high tech yeah. and the very low daily uh, yeah. needs. Thank you. Yeah. That question is right on because uh, we ha I'll give you a tangible example of a farmer who's using this right now. So we had a dairy farmer who is trying to improve the productivity of milk, but go goat dairy, goat milk. Uh, so usually they go to extension officers, which are in your county. Extension officers are the one who will give you advice. They're government employees. Um, so they would give you advice on this is what you need to feed your goats, and this is the output. 
This happens everywhere in Africa, but in Kenya and many counties. You go to extension officers to seek knowledge. What fertilizer should I be using? What should I feed my, I have a problem with my pest. You go to agro vets, that kind of stuff. Now, all this information is given by a human being to the farmer who does it and then probably works or doesn't. But there's, there's nothing is captured on the other end. If it works, they're not coming back and thanking this uh, you know, extension officer, thank you so much for saving my goats and improving my, they don't do that. If it doesn't work, they definitely are not coming back. You know, they already hate the officer, they think the officer is corrupt and didn't give me the right information. In either case, it's our loss because we are missing out on what works and what doesn't. We changed that. We created an accountability system where we need that data, what happened on, what, on the basis of the advice that we were given. We started taking this over the last six years. As of today, this is actually working right now. This is not a hypothetical case study. We have so much data around goat farming that if you go to an extension officer, all they have to do is open up their cell phone, simple cell phone if it has a 3G connectivity, use our portal and just put in the information. Okay, so you are a goat farmer, so you have 50 goats. Let me just put in this information. What is your current productivity level? Okay, it's you know three liters of milk a day. You want to get it to eight liters or you need to feed this crop and you are gonna find it in this part of your county because it grows this kind of a crop in your county. And guess what, if it doesn't grow, now you actually know a gap that a farmer can fulfill by growing those crops. So you're also creating new market opportunities. You are actually stimulating the economic growth for growing these crops because there's a real demand for that farmer to use that. There's already a consumer waiting to buy your product. You would be a fool not to you know, fulfill that demand. So this is an example of how we are using data tangibly to actually allow farmers and even growers to improve their productivity on both ends. I hope that kind of gives you an idea. Thanks. Thanks. Yep, another question. Yep. Hello, uh, here in the United States, we had a very lovely uh, climate bill that was crafted around uh, you know, 2020. It's called the Build Back Better Act. It was yeah. wonderful. It had so many investments in e-bikes and da da da. And then it ran into the United States Senate. And uh, so my question is, how do you sort of factor in the political limits into your modeling of the impact of these policies? And is there a way sort of to include that reality, which doesn't just exist in the United States Senate, maybe worse there, mm. but how do you factor that into your modeling of the climate impact of the policies you're considering? Fantastic question. Um, and also one of my questions I had for the second round was the potential, which maybe is relevant to, to, to your question, is a potential for more of a green lobby, like constructive, socially oriented lobby, um, for for the right policies to put pressure on the decision makers when they're not thinking um, and acting in the common interest. For, for example, I had an interesting conversation with a member of the European Parliament, um, <clears throat> who's a very progressive uh, MEP, and was asking her, you know, is there a progressive business green lobby showing up in your debates on these very important issues? She says. Ben and Jerry's sometimes shows up mm. <laughs> and lobbies for progressive change, but then they're drowned out by the other companies, yeah. for example. So I, that may or may not be relevant. And uh, to, to this discussion, who has comments? Arnaba, you have yeah. a, and then Johan, yeah. Do I need the microphone? Uh, uh, <laughs> Thank you for the recording. Uh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> this is a, it's a, it's a great question because you're absolutely right. In, in all democracies, you run up against this problem. So. Uh, when we think about exponential system change, you know, think about what might be the drivers, right? One driver is crisis, right? You have a pandemic, and because it's, it, it is such a major issue, you, you manage to produce a vaccine uh, within 18 months rather than you know, five years, and you deploy, right? But crises have a problem that they don't always last out too long. So when, when that political pressure goes off, the, the incentive to carry on reduces. The other ch approach is um, international pressure, international negotiations. You sign up to things, uh, but we know that all of that takes very long to, to come through, and that's why 30 years since the UNFCCC was initial, we are struggling to abate emissions. And therefore, the third thing uh, is what I call when you have a convergence of the interests of the elite and the vulnerable. Now, the elite, I don't mean as the rich. It is mean the, those who are entrenched. So today, the fossil fuel interests might be entrenched and might be lobbying various parliaments, right? So one of the things we are talking about in our high-level export group is if you're making net zero commitments as companies, you cannot then be lobbying against, mm -hmm. you know, uh, progressive climate policies in your, 
national jurisdictions. But beyond that, you've, we've got to use policy to create new sort of uh, political interests. Um, so to give an example, we, have, we had less than 20 megawatts of solar in India in 2010. We have 60,000 megawatts of solar in the country today. We have 165,000 megawatts of non-fossil capacity, aiming for 500,000 megawatts of non-fossil capacity by 2030. That would be the first major economy that will build more renewables than its entire electricity system as it exists today. Mm -hmm. Now that would create a whole new political economy of people and companies that would have an interest in furthering the clean energy transition. And what has happened just in the last 18 months, you'll see some of the largest conglomerates which have very strong fossil fuel uh, interest, for instance, Reliance, which, has, which owns the world's largest refinery, has committed to investing in, in the new energy sectors of solar, batteries, and electrolyzers for hydrogen in the tens of billions of dollars. Uh, Adani, which another company that has struggled with its coal policies, et cetera, is actually by sheer acquisition is now the largest renewable energy player in the country with about 20,000 megawatts of renewables under its own control. So you're, you're able to change that political economy when the interests of new elites converge with the interests of the vulnerable, those exposed to climate risk. Now, how do you engineer this? Of course, it changes sector by sector. How do you bring in for electric mobility? So just to give an example, you, you talked about the legislation, but even the Inflation Reduction Act, right? It's $350 billion. Uh, in India, our mobility, renewables, and, and green hydrogen plants are not under one legislation. We're sometimes getting that one grand legislation is politically challenging. But if you add up all of these policies, it's over $550 billion of investment this decade. Thank you. And Johan and Magnus, you had a comment on this question? Yeah, if we recall the <clears throat> exponential scaling curve, mm -hmm. a real challenge is that, uh, that in the really early stage, you will have a lot of actors actually try to, to block the development because the incumbent industries will take big risks when we actually shift out the old solution to the new solutions. So most of the lobbies will actually uh, work against uh, these adoption of curves. And I think it's really important to realize that. We see that in the car industry. I think it was interesting that the Volvo actually left the transport organization because the European transport organization is working against uh, really uh, uh, moving forward mm -hmm. uh, towards really tough climate targets. So that is extremely important. Now, as part of Race to Zero and that particular work, it's now starting to emphasize that companies need to take responsibility for, for driving uh, positive policies for the mm -hmm. 1.5 ambition. Mm -hmm. So we actually, in this playbook which we launched this week, we integrated these particular requirements on all our members. Mm -hmm. And that basically means that as a company, you should disclose which trade organizations you're part of. You should really analyze if they are blocking the 1.5 ambition or supporting it. And you should consider leaving it. But also companies need to drive policy influencing. And one final example is just before the election where we thought that the discussion on both sides in Sweden were really um, extremely, I would say, going on a very, very low level, I would say. So we managed to gather companies in two weeks, mm -hmm. together with We Don't Have Time, mm -hmm. representing 20% of the GDP in Sweden, actually stating we want to get rid of the fossil subsidies. Mm -hmm. We want stronger regulation as well. And I think that shows the opportunity to mm. actually gather mm. companies together for another type of movement on the front line. Excellent. 
amazing example. Magnus, you had a comment? Yeah, it was actually like uh, along the same lines that I agree with, with Aronaba. It's when you have convergence between interests that something happens, when the political demands are backed up. So, so I think that business has a huge role to play and, and also to engage in like, why do we see momentum in mitigation uh, policy today. It's because there are enough companies today that actually has an interest in it. And that points out that, that there is perhaps a, like a feedback mechanism here as well that can either work as gravity that pushes against the new solutions or when you got over get over a certain like the amount of lobbying is perhaps proportional to the amount to the investment some in, mm -hmm. in a business. So to begin with, uh, lobbying gravity works against the new solutions, mm -hmm. but at some point there's enough money invested in the new solutions to push, yeah. push it the other way. So one problem is that the future has no lobbyists, but <laughs> I think that, that mm -hmm. in integrating that into what you demand mm -hmm. from, from companies to be good global citizens in the climate, uh, that mm. is really an important step. Mm. Great. I, wonder, I think we're out of time, so maybe we can continue mm. the discussion uh, outside of the plenary. <laughs> um, so just uh, maybe just one final word to you, Jan, about uh, any future thoughts about developing this concept of exponential policy mm. or where you think it needs to develop further or any last thoughts you have about the concept. I, I think the framework would be really mm. interesting to sort of develop and to do that in collaboration with many parties, basically. Uh, I think that would be incredibly powerful. I do agree that we need to take a wider perspective. It's not just climate, it's, mm. it's jobs, but it's also, um, it's also equality and how we basically we need to build in the transformation to actually actually shift the wealth as well in, in the system and in the value chains. It has to be, and I think there is an opportunity to do that by completely reinventing value chains. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, I also think there are great examples as has been mentioned here of incredibly interesting innovations. So an opportunity to connect some of these and, and work in a node network basically to, to strengthen these initiatives together. So I think it will be, we are absolutely positive to work together on all these ideas from our perspective. Wonderful, excellent. Well, thank you. This has been a very, very rich session. Thanks to all the brilliant interventions and thanks for joining us. So let's thank our speakers. For